Um, welcome to another interview for VIT today. We have with us the Honorable Member of Parliament, Ms. Minakshi Lekhi. Ma'am also serves as the National Spokesperson for the Bharti Janta Party, the party in power in India. And also, she's also a reputed Supreme Court lawyer. Um, Ma'am, we're glad to have you on the interview show for VIT today. And uh, we hope we can have a fruitful discussion. Um, it's a delight to have you. So um, we wanted to start this discussion by uh, something perhaps more open-ended. Uh, we wanted to get your take on a more open-ended discussion in the sense that uh, do you think that conservative in not necessarily any parties, but just right-wing and conservative ideologies and uh, policies in the 18 to 22 year old age bracket is somehow aversive in the sense that it does it, does not connect with the younger generation. Do you share that uh, line of thought in any way? Absolutely not. Because uh, this kind of comment can come from someone who's not aware of what conservatives are, what right-wingers are, and what national youth parliamentary scheme is. And none other than uh, Prime Minister Modi is the one who launched it. So NYPS was launched by PM Modi with a vision to organize youth parliamentarians across the country. And he started this portal and so many engagements, whether it's um, exam per charcha or health or COVID, the constant engagement through social media platforms is uh, done by none other than our uh, prime minister. Uh, I don't know, sometimes I feel, I mean, I have children your ages and uh, so I relate differently with this age bracket. Uh, and I feel that uh, uh, youth of the day uh, somehow needs to be uh, guided differently in schools and colleges because uh, the education system is actually not taking care of uh, uh, their character building and uh, uh, the knowledge which they need to have about their own country. I was listening to some uh, blinks last night and some blogs about chemistry. And I mean, I, I just get into these modes of uh, reading anything, listening to anything, uh, not necessarily connected with my work because that's what I believe in, that uh, learning is a constant uh, process. And uh, what is connected, what is not connected, only time can tell. As long as you, can, you have the capacity to absorb knowledge, you should continue doing that. So I remember doing that and I was shocked because all these uh, uh, literature is coming from um, US and Europe and uh, the kind of investment uh, uh, Chinese have made. So when they are discussing about Greek or Roman uh, civilization, they will talk about blue color, they'll talk about how chemistry worked, etc., etc. Nobody talked about indigo, which is um, in my uh, knowledge of the world, uh, Harappan civilization to ancient civilization of India had, and we dyed our clothes blue, and blue was uh, a very common dye which we used. Uh, so blue was not really uh, something very special, which till uh, uh, late um, medieval centuries, uh, Europe did not even know. And uh, none of these blinks talked about uh, uh, chemistry which Indian civilization had to offer. Uh, for example, iron smelting. Till date, the kind of uh, pillars Ashoka built in, I don't know, 5, 500 BC or before that, uh, they are uncorroded till date. And that can only happen once you acknowledge the kind of chemistry and chemical processes which were going on. So I'm, what I intend to say by this particular graphic example is, that uh, across the globe, people are unaware of the greatness this country has produced. And not taking pride in that is keeping our youngsters away from civilizational conquest, which we have undergone. And, and it is for this reason that when you yourself forget about your culture and not wanting to learn, uh, and when I say, you know, uh, learn Sanskrit, uh, or uh, any of these things, I'm not telling people to be unscientific in their approach. On the contrary, I want them to be more scientific. People are talking about atoms and molecules in 19th century, uh, middle of that. And whereas we had the concept of Anu, Pramanu, etc. in the 
pre vedic vedic literature when um, even post vedic literature upanishads were post vedic so upanishad isha upanishads talk about it and we have ayurved which is complete chemistry because it's talking about plant based medicine and it's nothing but how chemistry operates on your system you have basic surgeries so i think a lot of science a lot of knowledge got wasted for many reasons and if we really want to establish india as a great country a pride amongst its people is very necessary and none better than youth to carry that forward and i have great hopes from this uh, age group for the simple reason i feel they are more questioning they are more open and they don't carry the burden in fact i remember when ram janm bhumi thing happened um, i had an argument with my children and i was saying you know so many invasions happened so much part of my country got uh, cut off from us so many new two more uh, new countries came out of my country and we have been constantly marauded and uh, uh, invaded and our people got converted our, our women were raped molested etc etc and my children said mom uh, why are you behaving like the other two religious groups who constantly have this sense of uh, victimhood you not a victim because you people fought we people fought and we have we are the only civilization which we which has existed through all the invasions and in centuries so i felt very nice it was a very refreshing thought they countered me and they told me that this is this is not right you cannot be in a victimhood mode in fact you have to say we are such great people that we withstood a lot of us lost but yet we withstood the centuries of invasion and centuries of onslaught and we kept going back to our civilizational root that's our strength and even today indians are the one of the brightest lot on this planet earth who find solutions to everything and that is credit to our civilization and credit to our way of uh, studying and looking up and family system all that has managed all of us to survive so uh, i i think uh, uh, right wing and left wing and center wing are useless analogies because all that depends on subject to subject and many a times i feel when it comes to uh, say um polity i think we are more left than the left could ever be because the jandhan yojana to lpg to uh, uh, pradhan mantri awas yojana to um, uh, kisan yojana all these are what these are inclusive india this is all to make india inclusive and uh, to reach out to the unreached and the way this government has reached out to people who have been downtrodden for 70 years i think we are more left than the left ever was because uh, left kept talking and and central so called other parties kept talking of socialism and uh, leftist ideologies where they were nothing but more capitalist than we could ever be because uh, uh, they were constantly uh, going to capitalist countries to uh, educate their children uh, they uh, they were uh, having the same kind of ideologies and work ethics Uh, which were which were not uh, for the downtrodden of this country and and had they been for the downtrodden of this country the downtrodden would not have existed in such large numbers the fact people of this country did not have bank accounts till 2014 can you imagine a country running without bank accounts uh, only 12 point some 58 or 83 odd crore bank accounts existed in this country a country of more than 100 crore people and when we joined in 2014 the very first schemes which prime minister brought in was to have bank accounts for people who did not have money so zero balance bank accounts what can be more inclusive and socialist and leftist than this in real terms so uh, i feel uh, these anomalies exist uh, when people don't understand uh, Uh, the real ethos so right left are are um, superfluous in my ideology i feel i'm right as rigst can be um ma'am so just a small uh, follow up on that 
um do you think that um certain kinds of ideologies obviously in the indian context we can't it's not right to put every you know even a party as a right wing party because there are multiple uh, um, stances you can have on issues but do you think that um, on certain issues um the youth basically does not connect to them as you said because they are not informed about these things but do you think that happens because there exist a few outliers for example if we take in the um, context of the united states say uh, you have some statements made by donald trump or you have certain politicians or certain figures making these kinds of statements when it comes to religion etc and they're taken out of context or probably they are just people with those views who are a minority and then the media blows it out of proportion and um, then we then we probably don't get to see the true representation of what those um, what those values are uh, when we talk about conservative values so uh, do you think that's true in some sense i i would agree but i would not pick up a foreign country's example for the simple reason <laughs> that i am uh, i will not comment about uh, other country except when i'm comparing it with my own country so when i compare my own country uh, i feel uh, look at what has happened in bangalore and uh, what has happened in bangalore is that right as rigst can that be right so these are fundamental questions now who is secular in fact i remember one of the mps from southern india yesterday or day before gave a statement uh, that uh, uh, am i not an indian diversity is not respected etc etc and uh, from any caste creed religion etc all those things so i just put one question i just co tweeted it and i just said one question i said tell me name a religion which accepts diversity just out of curiosity which respects diversity which respects different ways of thinking and different ways of worshiping tell me one religion now obviously these are sanatan paramparas these are hindu paramparas and you keep calling me fundamentalist all the time for being correct for being right for being accepting you keep calling me fundamentalist all the time or conservative for that matter i would say i'm more liberal than any of the liberals put together because i accept everyone whether you are religious you are non religious whether you worship a stone or you worship a god or you worship a goddess or you don't worship at all or you worship another god or another religion i still accept you because for me god can have various forms expression can have various forms diversion and diversity in thought diversity in expression diversity in food diversity of all kind is acceptable to me now am i liberal or am i conservative in the real sense what is conservative conservative are the people who are not willing to mold out of their own mold that is the real definition of conservatism now here is an ethos which accepts just about everything and everyone on earth on this planet and you put me as conservative now tell me who's a liberal according to me a, a certain types who have chosen to call themselves liberals are actually fundamentalists and those fundamentalists cannot think beyond their own idea and ideology and completely unaccepting of a different point of view they are not even willing to argue the point of view or forget about listening and converting whereas i am willing to listen i may not get converted but i'm willing to hear you and and it is in that context that one has to see a media so called left liberal controlled media i would call it it's not left controlled they use left only as a as a as a label and they are not left at all they are capitalist and they are the ones who are most fundamentalist so they are simply by juggling with the worlds they don't become liberals and they don't become left either because all their lies wine women and all kind of uh, uh, things uh, uh, happen and that happen in every society why are you labeling yourself as left left because left ideology is accepting left ideology is to work for downtrodden and when you start working for capitalists how are you left then you are capitalists simply by saying you are a left you don't become a left look at the lifestyles look at the way they live look at the manner in which they conduct their businesses and and they are in business let's let's be honest 
and and what i dislike i have no problem with others having a different kind of lifestyle or having a different kind of business it's their business and i am accepting enough that democracy permits us all that but don't label yourself as a misnomer left or a misnomer liberal because you are anything but liberal and you are anything but left right ma'am thank you for that answer so um we wanted to discuss the uh, nep the new policy that has come into action by the mhrd ministry um uh, starting off this discussion i want to get your take um it's been 30 years since the last uh, big reform has come to the education sector and being college students it affects it affects us affects us at a very personal level so if you could just give your opening remarks and we can probably discuss that further on so i uh, always um, used to debate this uh, in my if you heard me ever uh, in in 2014 or pre 2014 uh, after i used to feel that uh, the 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 study system is not right because everyone doesn't have to become a phd scholar everyone doesn't need to do that no country in the world produces phd's by numbers phd's are meant for people who are genuinely interested in higher research it cannot be a place to park yourself unnecessarily which we saw i will not name the university but we we saw and we know that lot of people in their 30s 40s 50s are just parking themselves uh, as a method of you know uh, getting some basic emolument which is fairly uh, nice uh, and uh, sticking around for uh, nothing i feel uh, youth has an advantage which with age i have started realizing it more that when you are young your limbs are functional you have the higher energy you can run around you have the speed you have the efficiency you can work many hours Uh, without sleep with without even blinking your eye your energy levels are very very different and that is the uh, efficiency and positivity of being young there is so much of effervescence when you are young uh, certain ideas are still developing but so be it but the physical energy the sheer physical energy is immense and if we do not harness that physical energy at the right age and at the right time india loses india loses a lot a lot of not just gdp but the future of this country so i felt that two things are very very important one is emphasis on skills and emphasis on utilizing the youthful energy which cannot be allowed to be wasted their creativity everything is not about rote a lot of things are about understanding and i haven't gone over the mathematical skills etc but when we were uh, studying and i was sitting with uh, that group over past many many months and a uh, couple of years ago and we found out that um, um in the um in the assessments our youth was not getting uh, whether it's mensa or other tests we were not making the cut and we were not making the cut i mean not all a certain section will always make it but generally uh, you know like as states will uh, go into those tests and all we were not making the cut and if you if you try to analyze that you come to a conclusion that there is something wrong in the way we teach our children and uh, some are privileged some have better educated uh, parents uh, they get a different kind of exposure at home so they manage things differently but per se everyone should be able to send their school uh, their kids to the school and every child has the capacity to to uh, to become vikram sarabhai or apj kalam or whatever else they wish to why do we miss out on those icons and why people are not able to come up to that level is not necessarily the fault of the youth but its bigger fault is lying with the system we are we are teaching our kids with so uh, and i compared it with uh, uh, say several other countries so 
when you analyze that, you find out that our children are taught not to work. We are very intelligent in terms of theorizing subjects, but we cannot, our engineers are not able to fix an AC. And um, they may be computer scientists, but you can't fix an AC at home. You can't put a nail on the wall to hang a, a picture. What, what is that engineer worth for? In my assessment, you know, I don't want people writing papers on the computers. I want people doing R&D and producing things and um, um, making things and technically sound people. And all that happened because we never taught them the skills. It's not their fault. According to me, it's not their fault. It is the system we are dealing with. And I genuinely feel, even today, that by the time a child passes class 10th or 8th, for example, up to class 8th, a child should have acquired certain skills that a child is able to later in adulthood. For example, I'm saying you are a, somebody is an 8th class dropout. Should an eighth class dropout be not able to manage his or her life? He should be able to manage his or her life and he should have requisite skill to survive the world. If one is a class 10th dropout, should that class 10th dropout not have adequate skill to be employed somewhere? According to me, he should be skilled enough to be employed somewhere so that he can take care of himself and herself. He doesn't need to worry about PhD. If, so, if somebody is able to do PhD very well, very good. But a class 10 should have certain basic skills, you know, carpentry, uh, 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 plumbing, something, something you can do or, or be employed in a factory to manage certain machines, to manage certain robo. You, you should be in, a, in that capacity. Class 12th child, uh, because if you, if you look the globe around and you look at the countries who have survived, all those countries have survived and done well because all their kids are very, very skilled. And there is no shame in uh, uh, doing uh, physical labor. A uh, physical labor is actually appreciated. So a lot of children, if, especially if you get exposure to travel, to see, to, to, to be in other universities, you'll see most children are funding and financing their own education because education is very, very uh, steep. The expenses are steep. And uh, they, are, they are supporting their families. And if they are not supporting their families, at least they are able to support themselves. I mean, look at Mark Zuckerberg. How did these people reach where they reached? Look at, look at uh, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Gates. So what I intend to say is I'm not saying people should become dropouts. I'm not, definitely not yeah. saying that. What I'm saying is that God forbid, if circumstances are not in one's favor and one ends up becoming a dropout for reason X, Y, Z, then that person should be in a position to survive the onslaught and be able to do very well in life. And all that lies in employability of a person. Now, employability of a person gets tested when you're facing the world. Now, you may be a PhD from IIT. I give a damn because you're unemployable. You are good at writing papers, but you can't handle a simple machine. I don't need such people in the industry. So employability is what one has to work at. And we have to understand that we need more technicians as compared to more theorists. But what we were producing is more theorists and no technicians. So emphasis needs to alter. And that emphasis is what this new education policy has tried to draw and if you look at, um, say, China and compare China with India, they definitely have higher number of technicians in terms of engineers, technical staff, et cetera, et cetera. Far, far, far greater number as compared to India. We produce people who keep doing PhD in African studies all their lives. Not worth it. Not worth it. Um, I don't need that. Ma'am, so, um, yeah, the new education policy has been rightly applauded um, 
like throughout the um, across party lines as well but one topic of debate that's uh, come out of it um, is that it states that till the 5th grade if i'm not wrong and wherever possible till the 8th grade and beyond as well the uh, medium of education should be in uh, in the mother tongue or the home language and um, so there's a lot of debate that whether in this day and age because of globalization and because of um, us trading with um, a trading overseas um should we shift our primary uh, medium of uh, communication in uh, at the education sector to english or should we stick to the home language see home language is not a bad thing at all because child's yeah. ability and understanding is far 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 greater i'll share one example uh, i grew up in delhi all my life and i had a friend who was you can say was like me only because we grew up at the same time and similar uh, circumstances so when we did class 10th i still date have that regret in my life i scored very well in mathematics because my mother was very good in maths uh, but i uh, i kind of lost interest in 11th i just kind of gave it up this girl was very very adventurous and she was too good and and she was extremely bright uh, student herself and she started visiting my mom in vacation and she my mother uh, language was hindi by the way she i mean she could understand english but her her calculation and her mathematical skills were all in hindi so she used to spend time with her and say aunty aap itni jaldi kaise karte ho so she will say aadha 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 pawa did did dhaiya like that she would speak and she will rattle out the tables and she would calculate so fast you know when you uh, talk of shakuntala devi or others i you know my picture in my mind is of my mother then i think she some, somehow in their school she studied in arya kanya vidyalaya in haryana and uh, uh, that time chandigarh was also haryana so her skills of mathematics must have come from vedic roots that's what i feel because the tables etc table of half table of one and a half table of two and a half table of quarter etc that's how their brains were trained so their calculations were much faster and this girl you spent about good one and a half two months summer vacation time with my mom and picked up the skills and later when we went to colleges i did my bsc honors but she did her bcom honors and she did her icwa and couple of other courses cs etc simultaneously she was that good uh, so i feel teaching in mother tongue is not a bad bad thing at all because we will survive we will survive with or without english for the simple reason china has survived russia has survived so many uh, other countries have survived and if you look at a, the globe english is one of language because we are surrounded by america uk and we share a traditional um, uh, relationship with them and we are able to communicate and definitely english is one of global language but when you look at the globe a large population in africa um uh, and uh, especially north uh, not north africa and uh, western europe and other places people speak french for example people speak a, a large population mexico i mean uh, south america and uh, several european nations they speak spanish for example uh, portugal and spain and so on and so forth uh, china by itself is a country but Uh, chinese get to be spoken by in different dialects by several other countries as well so uh, to say that uh, if you don't know english your global survival is impossible is a wrong assumption the only thing is if you've done your say primary or say um, middle school uh, in in your uh, mother tongue your thinking skills are better and your understanding gets to be developed more now if you have exposure in english since the childhood then your thinking skills are also in english sometimes i feel it's a it's a drawback because your uh, pick up in many other things you know like you have to speak in hindi you'll first think in english and then translate it in hindi which is wrong it ideally it should be the other way around so uh 
to, to have a grasp over um, uh, subject. Uh, the language uh, is what is so-called a language, your mother tongue, because that's the language you are listening all the time at home. And that makes education more equitable also. Because uh, uh, all of you may come from well-off backgrounds where uh, parents are English speaking and you have spoken English in school and colleges and other places. But at the same time, there is a large population in this country where uh, parents may actually be, you know, I'll say somebody who's a, who's a laborer, somebody who's a tea seller, somebody who's uh, hawking on the streets why should their children not have the same right to education or employment for that matter? They are as bright and maybe sometimes more bright only because your teaching medium becomes English, that whole lot of good and intelligent students get to suffer. So uh, mother tongue instructions is not a bad thing at all. And that too, only till primary or middle school. And then of course, and, and that means you are learning the other language also. It's only a medium of instruction. So, uh, you know, if somebody is not able to say two into two, but do do ni char, chalega. It's it's fine, absolutely fine. Right, Bob. So uh, we just we have uh, seven eight minutes left on the call. So I'll quickly squeeze in one last question. Um, so the. Um, this marks one year of Article 370, that is the formation of the new two, two new union territories. And uh, in researching this question, I came across an Oxford debate between uh, the Vice President of BJP, Mr. Panda, and Mr. Yachiri, the President of CPM. And the interesting arguments made on both sides in terms of inclusion of the union territory giving way to the uh, laws passed in the Indian Parliament now applicable to Jammu and Kashmir, very important laws like uh, child marriage and the LGBTQ law. But the counter narrative that was portrayed by Mr. Yachuri was that there are unlawful arrests, there's still human rights violations in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, ma'am, you being a lawyer, could you probably give us uh, your take on what the situation in Kashmir is and uh, what, what according to you is the situation of Kashmir after a year, especially after the appointment of the new left and governor? What is your take on this situation? So one thing um, I would say is Panchayati Raj, as a, as a student of governance and as a student of law and uh, left liberal uh, ideology. When you talk of governance, governance means grassroots governance. Grassroots governance means people have a right to build the school, people have a right to make the road, people have a right to get a water tap, isn't it? For 32 years and more, there was never a panchayat election in Kashmir. And what grassroots democracy are we talking about? So your 72nd amendment is not getting implemented in our state and you say we want a state to run like that. How just is that to the people of Jammu and Kashmir? So much for governance, so much for freedom. The real freedom is when people are able to govern themselves. And that can only come through grassroots democracy. And grassroots democracy can only come when you allow panchayats to function. Panchayati Raj should get precedence. The tribal rights should happen. Now, a state is governed in a manner that its OBCs don't get a right. Its SC, ST communities don't have a right. Its women do not have a right even to get married outside the state. Can you imagine? Now, <laughs> I, I was just thinking, and I normally give this example of Abdullah's. Farooq Abdullah's marriage was to a British person, a, a Scottish origin. And I believe even his mother was a non-Indian. And Farooq Abdullah's son married a woman, a Punjabi girl from outside the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And Farooq Abdullah's daughter also married a man outside the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now with all this paraphernalia, Farooq Abdullah's son's children could yet be absorbed by Jammu and Kashmir and become the chief ministers or reach high positions. But the daughter's children could never become because daughter loses her citizenship of the state. Now imagine how fair is that? And how do you justify under the left liberal women rights perspective? Do you justify that? 
they keep talking hopping upon are uh, sc rights and st rights and all that nonsense all the time what about scs of jammu and kashmir who have no right they are not even citizens and what about a, i mean a, a girl who qualified the exam could not be taken in because her forefather some 100 years plus had come to the state and continued to be non state uh, citizens uh, non state actors in that sense they were they were they were they lived in the state and yet they were not citizens and she qualifies the exam again from sc community so what inclusive uh, 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 and left liberal views do you have on that and that's why i call them they are not leftist at all they are not liberal they are fundamentalists because they only want to govern by confusing people all the time i think the more inclusive format is what this government has given interesting part which people do not know about in 60s itself so jammu and kashmir was a much bigger state part of it was usurped by pakistan and the pakistan occupied kashmir underwent the central legislation run by punjab in 60s and india did not even object identical to what we have done now in 2019 is what pakistan had done to their side of jammu and kashmir and india never objected never even raised a voice that this is an occupied area and you cannot do this because this is against you cannot control it Uh, we need to um, uh, uh, speak to the people of the uh, land and they kept infiltrating that area by punjabis from pakistan and and nobody talks about this model of governance i mean i i would have asked all these questions to mr yachuri but irrespective i'm sure he is better off without those questions so what 370 has done is actually brought democracy for the people of the state who were suffering all this while and had absolutely no say because state was run by parties who were usurping their powers and not granting it to the real people of uh, the state they were ill treated uh, discriminated people of ladakh imagine ladakh has the highest land mass and lowest amount of expense for ladakhis and lowest absorption in government jobs was to ladakhis they were not granted any jobs jammu has the highest population makeup but not so high uh, uh, geographical area and right, right. those people were denied their rights now people in only kashmir valley only the valley was controlling higher number of seats in legislative <laughs> assembly was controlling the higher amount of uh, uh, government expenditure was controlling everything else so i think uh, what this government has done abolition of a temporary provision man why why should there be so much of fracas it was meant to be temporary in the first place and temporary stayed for 70 years is shameful it should have gone in 7 months so i can conclude so my my conclusion uh, to 370 is that uh, 370 was a temporary provision meant to have ended in 7 days to 7 months but uh, it did not not only took 7 uh, years but it took 70 years so which is which is a huge loss to this country and several centuries um, uh, lost out on development on integration on the benefits of democracy um, it's a good ridden to bad rubbish and we allowed our neighbors to play politics in the state and that to the kind of terrorism and all that because of this just one article because it it separated them for rest of india which cannot be done and i'm i'm so glad it has happened so it's uh, necessary not just for uh, politics it's ending bad politics and i'm grateful to uh, my prime minister and home minister for having shown the spine to be able to make uh, a temporary provision redundant which it was In, on day one of its construction. Um. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, the last question that is the follow up to that. Um. We want. Uh, I wanted to know uh, that what is in your opinion should be the next step to get the trust 
of the Kashmiri people, or do you think that, or do you think that there's a lot of work to be done there, or is it something that we only see um, in how in the way media portrays it to be? So, uh, so far as trust of Kashmiri people is concerned, I think trust of Kashmiri people is not an issue at all. Because a normal person is what a normal person is interested in. A normal person is interested in safety, security, uh, food, uh, education, health, and all that was missing, and equality. Uh, all that was missing in the state. So state uh, um, um, is being granted what it deserves, but you cannot give fundamentalists what they want. And that struggle will continue. And that struggle is not just in Kashmir. That struggle is uh, in rest of India. That struggle is in rest of the world. World over, that that uh, uh, that mindset struggle will continue. And and uh, we have seen uh, many examples exist in history that uh, that mindset will have to be battled. And that mindset you cannot win. And you should not even try to win. You have to finish that mindset. Right, ma'am. So I think with that, we'll conclude the interview. It was a pleasure talking to you today. And uh, it's really humbling to have you here on the show. I'm pretty sure as a member of parliament, you have a lot of work to do for your constituency. And it's really humbling to have you on the show. And I hope we can probably have you down at the university at some time and give a talk to the students' live when things are better. So thank you so much for uh, from my editorial, editorial team and the students of the university for being here today. Thank you, Sarthak. Thank you,